I'm now going to go one step back after Lorraine has spoken about um, how all some of the complexities in actually um, linking data longitudinally. I'm going to go back to the initial step because typically we can't um, link uh, individual records um, unless we have um, respondent consent um, to do so. One of the um, things that we encountered, um, so I'm working in the um, Understanding Society and British Household Panel Survey team, and uh, when eight years ago in 2008, we asked um, our study uh, members to uh, whether they would be happy for us to link their DWP records um, to the responses they have given in the study, we were pretty um, shocked and um, not very happy to see that only 40% of our study members were actually um, happy to do so when um, on um, the MCS and other cohort studies um, those linkage ra or consent rates were more in the region of 70 or 80 or even 90%. So um, we were wondering like what, what has happened here and um, so um, the main thing that we did was basically we, um, we launched a research program into um, what are the correlates of consent and um, is there anything we might be able to do um, about it, like could we um, train our interviewers better, could we um, um, create or design our survey instruments better, um, etc. So um, yeah, when we look at the um, general um, literature about um, uh, consent or correlates of consent, there is a lot of heterogeneity, um, both in the success rate, as I have um, said, um, but also in terms of um, respondent characteristics that are predictive of consent, or um, also in terms of the survey design features um, and also interviewer characteristics. So that's the three things that are going on um, as um, we are interviewing people. We have a respondent, we have an instrument, and we have an interviewer who can sort of moderate um, anything that's going on. So. Um, Unfortunately, when we look at respondent characteristics, every single study pretty much finds something else. So sometimes it's age, gender, and socioeconomic status or health for health studies, which are um, correlated with consent. Um, ethnicity, um, typically ethnic minorities are less likely to consent, so that's consistent across um, different studies. Um, but um, yeah, health um, stuff, for instance, isn't really um, predictive in, um, in the BHPS or in Understanding Society. And um, we've done one paper um, under the CLOSER project, um, which basically uh, compared um, the cohort studies, which are more rooted in the health um, sciences, um, with um, BHPS and Understanding Society. And we found that um, the more rooted in health um, the study is, the, um, the more um, were um, health characteristics as reported by the respondent predictive of their giving consent. Um, the only thing that um, these sort of comparative studies showed were always um, linked to um, respondent consent were the respondents' sort of um, perceptions of risk and um, attitudes to um, but altruism, so for instance, um, people who were more likely to vote left or for left-wing parties were more likely to consent, or people who were more trusting generally um, of others, um, or people who had a greater sense of community, um, they were more likely to consent. But um, otherwise, um, it wasn't really um, consistent across um, studies. There's also been some research into survey design features, so um, which domain of um, data linkage it is, um, whether the question wording matters, whether the question ordering matters, whether it matters whether you ask for a signature um, or not um, to, um, to link um, to, the, um, to the administrative records. Um, and um, in one paper, um, which we did on the basis of, um, un, uh, on, of the British Household Panel Survey, um, we found that the sequence uh, or the interview sequence within the household mattered. So um, the, um, the more consents had already been collected in the household, the more likely um, it was for the interviewer to, um, to get an extra consent, which kind of makes sense. <coughs> but um, really it wasn't like that consistent and um, so we, for the BHPS in particular, we thought like it, it really has to do with the interview and we knew from, um, from qualitative evidence or talking to the fieldwork agencies that really some um, interviewers who had been working on the study for like 18 years um, at that time really hated um, the, um, the, uh, the consent question. They've never dealt with it before. It was like an innovation um, and it was an innovation at the end of that survey basically, which um, didn't go down very well with them. So, but um, obviously that's um, where we needed some more um, data on that. So when we look at um, studies, and again, this is studies from Germany, from, um, from the UK, and also from um, America, um, we find that typically um, 28 to 34 percent of, um, of the variation in consent is attributable to interviewer characteristics. 
Um, and then there's obviously some theory going on, like what interviewer characteristics, uh, characteristics that might be. But again, it's inconsistent findings throughout. So the um, age and gender didn't really matter. Then um, experience on the surveys was sometimes positively related to consent, sometimes negatively related to consent, personality traits and um, attitudes to persuading um, respondents um, at the doorsteps. Um, so that's gaining the initial cooperation to, um, to participate in the study. Didn't matter for consent outcomes. Um, there was also um, one study um, in Germany which, um, which asked interviewers um, whether they would themselves um, consent to data linkage and that didn't even sort of seem to matter for the consent outcome. And um, yeah, one um, thing that we found in our study with um, BHPS again um, is that the task specific um, experience um, mattered. So um, I've already mentioned, so um, I'm working on these household panels uh, data for, uh, for Britain. Um, and um, that's a specific sort of um, situation where um, everybody in the household um, aged over uh, 16 is being interviewed. And uh, the whole household is interviewed by the same person. So you can then actually sort of work out like what is the experience with asking consent that the interviewer has had before entering this household and then what extra uh, experiences have they um, had um, since sort of coming to this household and to this specific um, interview. So that's something that um, we um, thought would be worthwhile in exploring more. So um, we got some money from the um, NCRM to look at understanding non-response on understanding society. And this had two parts. So one part was um, that we audio recorded interviews um, and um, that was basically to open this sort of black box that what, what exactly is going or is happening as the interviewer asks this question and as the respondent then sort of um, responds, um, do they have problems, do they ask for clarification, this sort of stuff. Um, and then um, also we had um, an interviewer survey where we um, put in lots of questions and asked the, um, the interviewers about um, their um, sort of um, experience with the instrument and uh, their attitudes to us uh, giving consent and things like that, and I'm going to um, talk about both of these. So with the audio recordings, um, our initial um, focus was really just on um, do um, interviewers actually read out the consent question as it is scripted, or um, do they divert from the script, and um, if so, what happens? Um, what did the respondent ask? Um, what other information did the interviewer uh, provide or withhold? Um, did the interviewer actually use the printed materials um, that, we, um, that they had on them? And um, the focus was really on just like coding whether or not a given sort of behavior um, was present or not, um, rather than sort of um, coding every utterance. Um, but having listened to um, 1,200 or so um, recordings, um, I think it was fairly clear that there was like a, a systematic pattern of what happened, um, although we haven't fully uh, analyzed that yet. In the interviewer survey, we had questions on um, interviewer attitudes towards the survey process. So um, what is their um, attitude about disclosing information? Do they think it's, um, it's a natural thing that you just have to do? Um, do they trust the government with information? Um, then their own um, behavior, so um, their response behavior uh, to the interview. So um, how many questions did they not answer? Um, of the questions that were posed to, him, uh, uh, to them, and then uh, would they hypothetically consent to data linkage? Then there um, are questions on the experience with the measurements. So um, did they um, find the um, information leaflets or um, any of the materials they were um, issued with helpful? Did they find the consent forms difficult or really easy? Um, and, um, and then we have um, interview expectations regarding the survey outcome. So um, do they think it's, it's an awesome thing to, um, to have so many surveys? And um, would um, society be better um, for it? And, uh, and also we have, um, which also I think is linked to expectations, is like the interviewer's past experience of, um, of um, obtaining consent. Um, or not basically will um, impact their expectations of um, how likely is it that, that I get the next uh, person to consent. Plus we have um, demographics from the fieldwork agency. In both studies, um, we basically look at the dependent interview, uh, dependent variable whether a respondent consented um, or not. And we have bivariate and multivariate logistic regressions. We wait and uh, we use data to look at this. Um, the first study, um, the audio recordings that uses um, innovation panel, which is a longitudinal um, panel study um, specifically designed to, um, to allow um, 
to allow um, research into um, longitudinal data collection methods in particular and um, we used the innovation panel um, of 2011 which was um, the fourth wave of the study. We had um, interviews with um, just over um, 2,000 people of which um, eventually um, well 68 0.5% of them gave permission to um, that their um, interview could be audio recorded. Um, then when we um, actually um, looked um, whether the audio file was there, etc., we were left with um, 1,246 um, uh, recordings that we actually listened to and coded up um, in that way that I specified earlier. Uh, that slide has come up a bit dodgy, but um, one thing to, um, to remember here is that all these results will um, basically um, be um, so basically the consent rate among those people who were happy for their um, interview to be recorded was significantly higher among um, the um, consenters than um, among the non-consenters. So this is like really um, the best, or like a very selected group potentially. And also the interviewer obviously may know that um, potentially these sort of consents to data link, it might be one of the things that we might want to eavesdrop on. Um, Nevertheless, when we look at um, what actually then happens in the um, interview, so you would think like, oh, if interviewers are very aware that, um, that um, they are listened to um, when they um, read out these questions, it's only 59% of those interviews or that recordings that we listened to where the interviewer really didn't make any changes to, to the question at all. Um, in 18% of the cases, there was some sort of minor change, and in 23% uh, of the cases, there was actually a major change, where really um, the entire sort of um, question was completely differently introduced, or um, it was decided by the interviewer, and you can hear it, um, that oh, it, the question wasn't worth asking. Um, and um, so um, other um, things that we observed was that um, an interviewer seemingly didn't ask the question. So that um, happened, for instance, when um, with major changes. So there was no real question, uh, for instance, or sometimes it was really just about the audio recording. So maybe there was like a procedural sort of mistake that um, the, um, th the recording didn't start at the time that the question actually was asked. Um, we found that 6% uh, of the cases there was um, an influence um, by the interviewer um, towards consent. So, um, oh yeah, and oftentimes it was something like, oh yeah, your husband said yes to that, so you'll do that as well. Um, and it was typically in that sort of gender association. Um, the other way around, I haven't heard it once. Um, then, um, yeah, there's other um, things like um, emphasizing confidentiality. What does the respondent do? Um, actually, not that much in terms of like the proportion of um, things, like how often did we observe these behaviors, except for asking for clarification. So 16% of the respondents um, were basically just sort of um, asking questions like, what, ha? Which then sort of prompted the interviewer um, to, um, to launch into any of, of their sort of um, behaviors. Now, when we look at um, how are these interviewer behaviors associated with consent, uh, we can see that, um, yeah, in particular, making um, major changes um, is um, associated with a sort of 12% sort of um, reduction in the consent rate. So that was, um, it's not a good idea, um, it seems. Then obviously, yeah, um, seemingly failing to, um, to ask the question is not a good idea either. Um, um, influence towards um, consent uh, is, um, is a good thing to do in terms of um, getting a high consent rate, but probably ethically isn't really the kind of thing we want to do because in, um, consent should be given freely and um, it should basically be up to you to make up your mind and not to the interviewer to push you in one direction or the other. Um, now, um, if we look at the respondent behaviors, we see, um, for instance, again, that asking for clarification is not um, a good idea. So if it can somehow be avoided um, that, the, um, <laughs> that the respondent uh, asks for clarification, that would be a great idea. But obviously, um, there's also, that's a bit um, counterintuitive, perhaps, that um, if somebody is um, concerned about signing the form, um, that that is associated with a greater consent rate, but that basically is um, because um, people will only be asked to um, or presented with the form when, uh, when they have already notionally given consent. Uh, that sort of makes more sense, um, but I have to think about how to actually include that in my models. Um, the presence of others is um, generally um, a 
it doesn't really matter, but um, if the others um, influence, then uh, typically it's a negative influence that leads to less consent. So again, in a household interview context, it might sort of suggest that we might want to sort of isolate um, people as in um, have um, interviews with just one household member at the time uh, when nobody else is around. Having said that, however, um, oftentimes the interviewer would actually, when they make a major um, change to the scripted question, they would basically then nevertheless refer to something else that had happened in the household previously. Now, when we put this into um, a multivariate um, um, model, um, then we can see that um, a lot of these interviewer behaviors are actually um, statistically significant, and there's really a lot in this model. Um, so again, um, now we find that there's no um, statistically significant association with, um, with making a major change um, to the script, but um, it's positive um, if, if you make a minor change. Um, for instance. So um, a minor change, um, I mean, like we were really rigorous there. So even like if the interviewer um, read department of work and pensions instead of department for work and pensions that um, was sort of coded up as a minor change um, and that it happened a lot. I mean, halfway through recording um, the, um, the behaviors, we, um, we, were, uh, we should probably have sort of um, coded that differently or included an extra sort of pointer to that because it's quite different. Um, but okay, we also found that um, obviously yeah, influence towards consent um, or towards non-consent um, stand out as factors. And um, when we look at the, um, at the respondent behaviors, in contrast, there's hardly anything that really stands out. Now from the household context, um, that's the other indicators. Um, we can see that, um, that um, an additional consent in this household is um, much more likely if um, there already has been a consent in the household. Um, when we look at what happened before the interviewer um, uh, came to this particular household, so that's things that, um, that are not really sort of, because like interviewer and respondent behavior, that's really is like an utterance, you know, like you can't really say like, oh yeah, it's caused by the interviewer, it's caused by the respondent, it's kind of happening like at the same time simultaneously. Um, but with um, things that happened before entering this household, it's really some um, knowledge and experience that only the um, interviewer brings to this um, interview. And we can see that um, the, uh, the number of um, consents that the interviewer has already collected before entering this household um, does not really um, positively impact um, consent. But um, if the interviewer has been um, unsuccessful, so the number of failures um, he has had before um, actually negatively um, predicts consent. So um, in terms of like what you could do about it, it, would prob it could be that uh, maybe as um, fieldwork agencies, we should sort of focus on those um, interviewers who have had uh, many bad experiences and uh, perhaps sort of halfway through the um, fieldwork period or so, give them extra training. And um, now if we look at the interviewer survey that was administered in 2014, we had um, 475, uh, 73 interviewers and the response rate was um, 58%. And um, here, um, it's basically just um, to give you a bit of a flavor what happened uh, here. So we can see that generally um, interviewers um, really um, believe in surveys and um, think they are important. Uh, and, uh, but then they are also like um, quite um, negative about um, trusting government uh, specifically with data and um, yeah, general levels of trust are relatively high, but trust in um, government is, is less sort of positive. And obviously because um, these are all um, government data that we want to link to, um, that obviously it might also be something where, um, where we might want to change interview attitudes somehow. But maybe it's not us as survey um, or fieldwork agencies, but maybe it's more the government themselves so should work harder. Now, um, this is um, about the measurement experience. So um, a lot of um, interviewers um, actually um, found um, the consent forms and leaflets um, easy, but, um, and, uh, but not so many people found, um, for instance, that these consent forms and information leaflets were very useful. Um, we um, observed that um, interviewer consent rate, um, uh, the hypothetical consent rate would be 69.7%. Um, By coincidence, that's exactly the rate that we got in wave one um, understanding society um, for consent. Um, then we can see that um, interviewers also um, vary um, a little bit in terms of like the different types of um, data linkage they would um, 
would um, consent to, but yeah, that's really just like for, for you to look at later. If we um, put these, um, these predictors into a multivariate um, model, then we can see that um, an interviewer not trusting um, reduces um, consent. So, um, and when we look at, um, compare that to, um, to the um, respondent characteristic, that's kind of in the same region. So the responding not trusting and, uh, and the interviewer not trusting is probably the worst um, combination for, um, for consent. Um, then we can see um, that um, the more um, concerned uh, interviewers are about data sharing, the lower is the consent rate, although that's not statistically significant. And this is like, uh, I don't know, looking at 35,000 um, individual interviews, so it's, it's quite big. So if, if there's nothing statistically significant in here, then probably it is not statistically significant. Um, if the interviewer would not consent to, um, to data linkage, then that's also no good for, uh, for the respondent uh, to consent. Um, however, there's a little bit um, of a, a factor that um, our interviewers who would readily give um, their consent to police records um, to, um, to be linked, um, they have actually lower consent. So it's kind of like, oh, if interviewers are a bit too sort of lax with um, or too keen to share their data and come across as a bit too pushy perhaps and um, not sort of conscientious enough, um, then actually they are not as good. Um, so summary, so um, we can see from the behavior coding that definitely um, behaviors um, seem to be related to, to consent. There's certainly some more work to be done in terms of coding up more the sort of typical sort of sequences and utterances that are going on rather than just taking the sort of did this behavior happen or not, but it takes some time to do that for um, for as many um, uh, audio recordings that we have. Um, we might um, also, but the database is there, so it, um, it would now actually be a resource where, where people could come and say like, oh yeah, let's pick out like specific cases um, or for specific interviewers who did particularly good or particularly poorly, um, or for um, say for ethnic minority respondents where we know and um, a lot of studies have shown consistently that ethnic minorities have lower consent rates. Um, and then basically we could sort of um, use this for, um, to identify um, interviewers who have a specific, or may have an, a specific training need, for instance. Um, for the interviewer survey, one of the things to, um, to take away um, is that, um, so respondents um, had asked for clarification when, when they were um, confronted with this um, request to link their data and um, also the um, this interviewers felt like oh, the material wasn't really that useful. And um, so obviously that's something to look into. And then um, also like knowing that um, interviewers or so many interviewers struggle to actually read out these consent questions. It's a long question. So I mean, like, to actually get it right, like exactly as scripted is, is a difficult task. And um, so um, we also know that, um, that interviewers who um, who were um, having a tougher time as, um, as per the um, responses they've given in, the, um, in their interviewer survey were actually more likely to leave um, the fieldwork agency afterwards. So it seems to have like asking for consent and the experience also needs to um, actually sort of cause problems to retain interviewers who might otherwise be um, pretty good at it or at, at their job. Um, yeah, I think that's just a link with further information and I'd like to stop here. Yeah.